We don't see the world as it really is. Instead, we see it through several cognitive filters. For example, we ignore familiar stimuli such as the clothes we wear through a psychological phenomenon called habituation. This is nicely demonstrated by the example of color after images. I ask you to fix your eyes on the black spot on the bird's neck in the center of the screen. Don't move your eyes until I tell you. As your eyes remain in the same position, the unusually colored image of a bird is being detected by neurons in your retina, which is a neural network with more than 100 cell types, including both excitatory and inhibitory neurons. It's particularly important that you don't move your eyes because only then will the image continuously activate exactly the same assembly of neurons in the retina. I hope you have not moved your eyes yet. You may now transfer your gaze to a few inches to the left of the spot. You should have briefly seen a normally colored kingfisher appear that then turned into a grayscale image. But you were never shown a picture of the normally colored bird. The original image you saw was a color negative of the true colors of the kingfisher. As you watched, your brain constructed a negative of this negative image, which is a positive colored image. This lingering positive colored after image was a cognitive filter overlaid on the grayscale image that came up afterwards. In the explanation for this illusion lies the logic of a mechanism for behavioral habituation, which I've termed the negative image model for habituation. A visual object like the kingfisher is represented by the activity of a specific retinal cell assembly. In much the same way, cognitive percepts are represented in the brain by the activity of a specific excitatory neuron assembly as shown in this slide. The blue cells indicate the levels of activity of an array of excitatory neurons or principal cells that respond to a certain percept. The red bumps in the image make an important point. Excitation of principal cells results in co-activation of inhibitory neurons. The level of inhibition on these cells is shown in red. The net response is approximately the difference between blue excitation and red inhibition. As this percept is experienced for a long time with no reward or punishment, excitation remains the same. However, inhibition onto the same excitatory neurons increases, effectively forming an inhibitory negative image. This can be thought of as an adaptive filter that reduces the net response to familiar percepts. And that, in a sense, is a negative image model for habituation. From all possible objects in the environment, habituation allows one to efficiently select a small subset of objects as potentially worthy of attention. So defects in habituation can be predicted to lead to sensory overload as well as to hyperstimulation. People on the autism spectrum usually show habituation defects as well as a feeling of being overwhelmed, particularly in complex environments. Jorge Luis Borges wrote a story wonderfully translated into English called Funes the Memorias, normally considered to be about a person who could not forget. If one considers Funes more carefully, it's obvious that in addition to not forgetting, he has almost no adaptive filtering as well as superhuman powers of attention, which is normally required for memory encoding. The relevance of psychiatry should make the mechanism of habituation particularly broadly interesting. In the text of this article, I highlight two proposals for how negative images may be formed. The first is inhibitory synapse scaling. The second is a stimulus comparator mechanism that forms the basis for most, but not all, modern models for the phenomenon of predictive coding in the brain. A potentially useful suggestion that I make in the article is that habituation should be viewed as a form of predictive coding. This perspective article represents ideas stimulated by a six-year collaboration with Veronica Rodriguez and K. Vijay Raghavan, colleagues who shared a Drosophila neurogenetics lab in NCBS Bangalore, as well as experimental data from their students, Sudeshna, Madhu, Indu, and Pushkar, and from my immediate students and postdocs, Aoife, Adrian, John, and Isabel in Trinity College, Dublin.